As a fifth generation Latter-day Saint, when I am here in Salt Lake City on Temple Square, I'm at the very center of my religious and cultural heritage. I've been here many times over the years, as when I was 19 and about to leave on my mission. All the missionaries and our parents were met that Sunday evening for a testimony meeting over here in the assembly hall. Back then, I never imagined that there were a number of church members who were dealing with strong attractions to the same sex. I gained more insight into that situation after I returned from my mission and earned a bachelor's degree in biology at Utah State University and a minor in psychology, and then went on to earn a PhD in a related field at Northwestern University. In 1991, I teamed up with a licensed clinical social worker from here in Salt Lake City and my brother, also an ISU professor, who has a gay son. And we edited a book on Mormonism and homosexuality called Peculiar People. That book, even after 12 years, is amazingly still in print and selling at a steady clip. I still regularly spend time here on Temple Square, sometimes with my children, for music, for flowers, and for worship. I'm much more aware now of how these attractions affect many different members of the church. Even across the street in the genealogy library, on certain days you can find there a young single member of the church in his 30s who is dealing with these attractions. Gary Horlocker is representative of many young men who would like to follow the plan of marriage, but as therapists in LDS Family Services tell us, only five to 10% are able to do so even after years of striving. Gary is going to tell us his story. I, uh, I grew up in a very, very loving, good LDS family. There were five brothers and two sisters and uh, my dad was in the National Guard. He had earlier been involved in school teaching and uh, my mom stayed, was at home and took care of the day-to-day uh, -day things. I was always a very good kid, uh, very sensitive to the gospel, to the church, and very involved. I was Eagle Scout. I uh, love scouting. I did 1,400 push-ups. I had the junior high push-up record. I was involved in sports, in wrestling, in football, and in music. I was in the choir and the band in high school. I was a pretty well-liked kid, I think. Um, I went on a mission to Norway. After my mission, I went to school at the University of Utah. I finished a master's degree there in linguistics, bachelor's and a master's degree. I decided to go back to school. Some of the professors at BYU in the, in the genealogy and the family history area encouraged me to go back and get a doctorate. Over the last two years or so, I've finally faced this part of my life where I've realized that I'm attracted to the same sex and I, and I don't have strong attractions to the opposite sex like most people do. And it's something that I never really considered uh, earlier in my life. It's, it's, I guess it's always been with me. I see the pattern through my life, but uh, being a member of the church and a good member of the church, it was never really an option to be gay. And so until I got to the point where I was very depressed and suicidal and just at a point where I was very desperate, uh, I was not able to face this. And I just kept trying and pushing to to get married and did a lot of dating and uh, so anyway in the last two years I, I found out about a group called Evergreen and I started going there and, and little by little I've kind of come to understand that uh, the, about my own uh, orientation, the attractions that I feel and so I hope that maybe by me telling my story, my journey, that uh, this can be a benefit to church leaders or others that are trying to understand what's going on with with the same-sex attraction or the homosexuality. I got involved in genealogy when I was about 12 years old, about the time I was uh, doing Boy Scouts. And, uh, and I don't know why, but for some reason I just 
I guess it clicks with my analytical brain or something and, and solving problems and, and the strategies you have to go through with genealogy, but somehow I just got hooked. You know, some people, I've heard a lot of people that are gay that say they didn't fit in in high school and they had this side of themselves that they knew they were different from everybody else. And, uh, and you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a little different because I did fit in and I, and I interacted well with the kids and I didn't see myself as different except for genealogy. I knew that that was different than my friends and I guess you could say I was in the closet about my genealogy because uh, I felt like I couldn't tell any of my friends that. Uh, my friends that played football and wrestling and, and uh, you know, they would just think I was such a nerd. That was for old people. That was, but but for me, it was exciting. It was fun. I really loved it. In the process, by the time I by the time I got 19 and was ready to go on mission, I had published seven books. Uh, the one book about this family going in the Midwest was about 400 pages long, and lots of pictures and stories. And uh, and then there was a follow up to that volume. And, I did a lot of dating. My parents felt like we needed to do a lot of dating and it was part of the culture in Utah Valley to do a lot of dating. And uh, we'd have a dance coming up, a uh, homecoming or something, and, and mom would say, well, have you got a date for the dance? And I'd say no, and she'd say, well, there's always, there's always Susie in the ward, or there's always, <laughs> she'd start naming off names of girls. And, and uh, I go, okay, I'll find someone myself, Mom. Because <laughs> uh, I didn't really care for the ones that she'd pick out for me, but uh, I could pick out my own. I never really was interested in having a relationship with a girl, but that was okay because we weren't encouraged to do that. We were encouraged to group date, have lots of people, never go one-on-one, -on -one and no kissing. Morality was probably the number one thing that was stressed in our growing up. And uh, there was something called petting, which we, which we knew was kind of pushing the boundary, was beyond it, but we weren't sure what that was. And then there was something called uh, masturbation. That was a taboo word. They very seldom said it, but they always implied that there was this thing. and but they didn't like the word, but, and I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew it was something really bad. <laughs> and uh, gay and homosexual were in that same category. They were words that were not talked about. Uh, it was, if they were, it was in a very, uh, in a way that, uh, that they couldn't really say the words. They just implied what it was. When I was in high school, there was a lot of, and probably junior high even, younger, maybe sixth grade or so, there were certain guys that I liked to be around and that were popular that I really kind of focused on, that I wanted to be close to and be near. But uh, I never really was curious about girls in the same way. There was no popular girls or there was no, there was just nothing about girls that fascinated me, but there was certain guys that really fascinated me. And, and I, you know, I, I never legitimized or could never ex even think about the possibility that there was a sexual attraction to any other guys during the period before, uh, before the last two years when I finally started to face this. But I was uh, on the camp staff of a Cub Scout day camp uh, for two summers before, when I was about 13 years old or so. Anyway, uh, there was this Hispanic guy that was part of that group that I really liked. And uh, I always wanted to sit by him in the car. And, uh, and uh, I didn't know what it was, it's the way he smiled or something that I just really liked to be around him. I always wanted to. And then there was another guy that I used to walk home from high school. He was a couple years younger than me, but he was Hispanic too. And as I look back on it, uh, they're, they're really the same symptoms as what we call limerence, and it's, uh, it's falling in love. I was quite disappointed if, if one of them didn't come to school one day, or if I missed seeing them at lunchtime, or if I drove by their house and they weren't there, I just kind of a little disappointed, a little... And, I, and if they were there, if I did see them, I just get so excited and so happy inside. And, 
And uh, I know that President Hinckley and President Packer have both said that, that those feelings, falling in love, the irresistible urge to be near somebody are God-given and that they're here for a purpose. And, uh, and I recognize that they're the exact same feelings that uh, heterosexuals feel towards the opposite sex. And, uh, and there, there isn't any difference. They're, they were the same. I never had a problem to leave behind anybody. That, and I always knew I was going to go on a mission. I think the hardest part of that for me was leaving behind genealogy. That was my real love. Really the best thing I got from my mission and where my spiritual experiences were is, is trying to help my companions. I think the mission president somehow was aware that I had a sensitivity and that I was sensitive to the needs of my companions and trying to help them. And I was given a lot of young missionaries that were struggling with testimony, struggling with, uh, with the work, a desire to be a missionary, a lot of problems, wanting to go home, and I think that that's really where I maybe made a little difference for some of them, is in trying to help them gain a testimony, learn Norwegian. Uh, dating girls was a little different after my mission than before my mission. Uh, the emphasis was to get married instead of just having fun, and in high school there wasn't any pressure to to uh, be affectionate or to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. But after my mission, I needed to. I was supposed to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Uh, of course, I didn't know how to kiss girls or how to. Uh, be affectionate or intimate with any of them, and I was pretty uh, awkward. And I dated a lot of girls, but uh, I kind of fell into a pattern that uh, it seemed like I would go on about two dates, and then after a while, after about two dates, two or three dates, then it kind of fizzled off, and I'd start looking again for somebody else. And this went on and on uh, for. I guess 10 years, because I was about 32 by the time I really started questioning this cycle. But I just felt like I needed to keep trying. Eventually I'd find the right one and it would click. But uh, I think the problem is, is after about two dates, guys start becoming more affectionate. They start kissing the girl or holding hands. And, um, and this is something that was very scary for me and I, and I wasn't very comfortable with it. I wanted to live in a house, and I, I was self-employed for a while, and I couldn't really qualify for a loan, so I felt like the only way to do this is to buy the lot and then build it myself as I earned money. And so uh, I went, visited my uncle, he builds houses, and he helped me draw up the house plans. And uh, I wanted to have a lot of kids. I grew up in a big family, and I thought, you know, eight or ten kids would be nice, and so I designed this house with six bedrooms. It's got five and a half bathrooms. It's really a big house, for over 4,000 square feet. Finding a wife was the hard part, and it just seemed like kind of a necessary step in order to fulfill this dream. At the time, I was working for the church, the genealogy library, and uh, there was a girl there that was good-looking, dark hair. She had been a return missionary, and uh, this particular girl uh, was giving me hints that she would go out with me, and so I asked her on a date, and it was the second date we were on. We were talking, and she said that she had had some experiences or some special things happened to her recently, and that if she was, if, if, uh, if I asked her to marry her, she would say yes. And uh, I thought she was a good-looking girl, and I was so interested in getting married. That was really my number one goal, is I wanted to get married. This is, I was probably uh, 29 or 30 years old at the time. And so when this girl told me on the second date that she would marry me, if I asked her, it kind of, all of a sudden, here's my goal and my dream is being possibility. and. Uh, Christmas was in two weeks, and all my family was coming, and it would be the wonderful time to make an announcement and introduce her to all my family. President 
Kimball had said that any two people that are dedicated to the church and have testimonies can make it work and you don't you know have to be in love and and I thought that love would grow anyway if I was close to somebody and uh, so uh, I went to the temple and I fasted and I prayed and I just knew that God would answer my prayer as I was sitting in the in the creation room in the Salt Lake Temple uh, I was sitting there as the, the ceremony started and I did have get an answer and, and it was like the veil was parted for just a few seconds and I was standing in the pre-existence and I was standing next to this girl and we were talking and she was trying to convince me to do something and I kept saying to her, I'm sorry, I, I just don't think I can do that and, I'm, and I was evaluating a lot of other things apparently that I was supposed to be doing and and she was very desperately trying to get me to agree to do this something and I didn't know what it was and I said I, I don't think I can do that and uh, and then it was gone and, and I was back to reality and I and I thought well that's an answer at least I knew her in the pre-existence but I'd really like a little more of an answer there happened to be somebody else on that session, temple session, that was a, a sister missionary that I knew from the genealogy library where I was working. And, uh, and she saw me and we talked for about two or three hours after our endowment session. She was very in tune with me as a person and, and caring and, and I just felt like there were too many coincidences, her being on the session and all these answers I was getting that I just needed to take this step of faith and, and do it and that the other confirmations would come along the way. So I did ask the girl, I made an announcement, I got special permission to make an announcement over the intercom system at the genealogy library. And uh, it was really just what this girl wanted. She wanted something spectacular, but I just kind of withdrew into a shell and. You know, my family was so excited and so happy that I was finally getting married and they just welcomed her with open arms and loved her and she felt like she was part of the family and she was so happy and my family was so happy and I was so miserable and I just sat in a corner through that whole Christmas holiday and just wished I could die. I don't know why. I mean, I knew I was doing what was right. I knew I needed to get married. but. Uh, but for some reason my body was reacting and I just was not feeling good. And uh, so anyway, we continued to try to make this work and I told her I'm sorry. I, I, she's used to dating guys that like to kiss and, and make out and be touchy. And I said, well, I'd like to learn how to do that, but I need to take it slow. And uh, after about a month, I was finally getting to the point where I was willing to experiment with it a little bit and try to learn how to kiss her. Uh, I think she was feeling some stress too. Uh, there were some, uh, about six weeks into it, we finally called it off. After uh, the engagement didn't work, uh, a couple months after that, I, I, I guess I started getting into a, this mental circle that kind of led into a very deep depression. And it was, at the time I was working for the genealogy library, I was accomplishing a lot of good. And I really didn't have a problem with knowing I was an important and a valuable person. It wasn't, when I got depressed, it wasn't about low self-worth. It was really about what is the purpose. And that's where I really got into trouble because uh, all my life, Everything told me that the whole purpose in life was to have a family, to get married. And I was starting to realize that this might not happen, this might not be possible for me, where I couldn't even kiss a girl. And, and it, I finally got that close and it didn't work out. And the possibility of that happening again, it just seemed like it might not, I couldn't, it, it probably would never happen again. And, no matter how hard I tried and did everything just the way I was supposed to, that I could never fulfill, uh, never come to the top of the celestial kingdom, which is what our goal is in life. If I'd come home to this house, and I was living in the basement at the time, but it would haunt me. I was alone in this huge house, and, and the children that I always dreamed of, and the wife, I just never, it's, it was not going to happen. 
I became so close to depression and suicide that, uh, that I finally talked to uh, the sister missionary that had been in the temple the day that I had decided to ask this girl to marry me. Uh, she had a son that was gay that she had talked about openly at the library and uh, I felt like I sh that if there was anyone I could ever talk to it would be her. And so I told her about that I thought maybe I was gay and or had these feelings and, and that I didn't think I could ever get married and that I was just suicidal and 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 we explored these feelings and, and uh, I had even bought some uh, rat poison and uh, I had bought and I had some medicine that I was allergic to that the doctor had said could kill me if I ate it and uh, and I was thinking up plans on how to commit suicide and and it was very scary for me because I knew that I was very serious about it. I remember one time thinking that I hadn't experienced anything in life as far as uh, I never drank any alcohol, I'd never smoked, I'd never done drugs, I'd never done anything sexual. And I thought, it's too bad to live my life and not experience these things. A lifetime of being good, I, I couldn't do anything wrong even if I wanted to. It just wasn't a possibility for me, which led to more depression because it was all black and white and I just couldn't, couldn't do it. I couldn't be bad and I couldn't be good. and so. I just wanted to stop existing, and uh, uh, that's not an option either. But uh, so I talked to her, and, and I, I finally I, I went to family services. Uh, I went to about three or four sessions with a therapist there, and at least got me in a place where I could cope again. And once I finally was able to kind of get away from those suicide fears. I, I did take the medicine and it didn't kill me and I never tried the rat poison, but, but I was in a very serious place there. A few blocks from here on Temple Square is the headquarters for Evergreen International. I have heard the executive director from Evergreen explain that they receive over 300 phone calls every month from members of the church who are dealing personally with same-sex attraction or from church leaders or family members who are concerned about it. This is not, as some have supposed, a small issue affecting only a few. The director explained that it is estimated there are five to six who have same-sex attraction in every ward of the church, and there are over 50 to 60 in every stake. That was the first time that I'd ever been around a bunch of other guys that were LDS, that believed in the church, that dealt with the same attractions as I did. And it was, all of a sudden, it kind of opened my eyes to a whole new world. They gave us uh, this word, same-sex attraction, and we have kind of shortened down to SSA which is uh, an acronym, but it's also an identity. I could say I'm SSA, and that's different than saying I'm gay, because if I say I'm gay, that sounds like it means I'm doing all these gay activities. And if I say I'm SSA, that means I have attractions to the same sex, but I choose not to be gay. And so all of a sudden I had a new way of understanding myself that was affirming, and I felt so comfortable about this that, uh, that I wrote up my story about how I'd come to understand myself. I read all these books about it uh, that the Evergreen Group uh, promotes, and, uh, and I worked through these different ideas, and uh, the first idea is that you have a problem with your father relationship and maybe too close to your mother. And I, I resolved all the problems with my father. I didn't feel like I had any problems with my father. And I think that there's enough evidence that other people had very good relationships with their father and, that's, and the fact that they're still dealing with this shows me that there's more to it than that. Well, the other idea was Medinger's idea that to become a man and do manly things, be a leader. As I pro progressed through this line of thinking, I realized, well, here I built my own house. 
Uh, I was on the wrestling team. I was on the football team. Uh, just because I don't like to hurt people, I don't like to be violent, I don't like to do rude things, to burp and be rude like some of my brothers might do on occasion or other men, uh, doesn't mean I'm not a manly person. And so I started to realize that, that this wasn't going away and I had talked to the bishop about it and given him a copy of my article and I said, now, when, if I do find somebody that I want to get married to, should I tell her about my attractions to the same sex? And he said, no, that's behind you, your history. You don't ever bring that up. If you do, she probably won't be interested. And, and so uh, I knew that that, was, that maybe wasn't good advice from the people that were married that came to Evergreen. That for them, getting married did not take it away. It still was an issue in their lives, and it was causing a problems for their marriage. I still wasn't getting on with my life and I was having a hard time getting to the point where I could get married and, and feel good about being intimate with a woman. I decided that in order for me to learn and grow, I needed to, to learn a little more about this. I had gone the evergreen route as far as I could go within that bounds and I would read everything and I would tried all of the therapies and so I decided to go to this group called Affirmation and this other group called Reconciliation, which are for LDS people that that are gay, and uh, and talk to more of the people there and learn a little bit more about it. And there were lots of people in that group that had been married. Some of them still were married. And uh, the fact that I wanted to get married, it was good for me to talk to those different people and learn what their experience in marriage had been like. So I started going and I, and I did find a couple guys there that I liked and, and developed relationships with. And they weren't sexual relationships, but they were very close and very uh, intimate relationships without crossing the boundaries of the church had. And, uh, it kind of opened my eyes to a whole new world because all of a sudden I could understand what this wonderful thing was that President Packer talked about and President Hinckley talked about to being in love, this irresistible draw of nature of two people that want to be together, that fulfill each other together. And I'd never f experienced that with a woman, but I, I, I started to experience that and I started to realize what it was. And uh, one guy I just met, we'd gone, we'd gone with his group to a movie and he called me up the next day and asked if I wanted to do something and he said, and I said, well, w when would you like to do it? And he says, well, how about tomorrow? <laughs> and I just like was so excited. I wanted to see him the next day and I thought, this is so different from how I felt about the women. I wanted to put it off as long as possible without them kind of dropping off and saying he's not interested, so I'd wait a week. Well, but tomorrow, yes, I wanted to see him tomorrow. And, it, you know, it wasn't like I was becoming sexual and going off the deep end, but it was a learning process, and I realized that I had to learn some things, and so I allowed this to happen. And I mean, I, I started to, all these things started coming together, and I started to realize that it's not a bad thing to love another person. And, of the same sex or of the opposite sex. The whole gospel of Christ is about love. And I started realizing as I go to this reconciliation group, it's like a home evening group for men that have been, some, a lot of them are still very active in the church and then a lot of them that are no longer active in the church, but they all value the religious tradition. And so we come together and we have this home evening group and a gospel lesson. And uh, afterwards, we all give each other hugs and, and kiss each other, not in a romantic way, but in a friendly way. And it's like, I don't know, to me it's almost like a group of girls getting together and they all hug and kiss each other and it's not a romantic thing, but, but it's a need that they have. And I think as a gay man, I have that need too, uh, of being affectionate and close. And all my life, I grew up in a family that was not a touchy-feely family and I was very depressed most of my life because I was keeping this boundary and I would never come close to people. I would never touch because I was afraid of that. I was afraid of being intimate or close. And here was a group of men that I could be close with and I couldn't do that in my priesthood meeting. I can't do that with straight guys. There's such a 
homophobia in our society. We're so afraid that that it's going to be out of hand that we're afraid to try that. Even in the Evergreen group, I'm afraid to touch or hold, you know, to I just give them a handshake most of the time. You know, the exciting thing, too, is that it's it's not a struggle anymore. It's, you know, I can choose to be celibate, but if I acknowledge that I have these attractions for the same sex, it's no longer a struggle. And to, uh, the hard part, the real struggle, is when I say, this is not me, this is not reality, I'm not really feeling this because it's wrong and I'm, not, and I'm a good person, and so I can't be feeling this. That's a very bad place to be in, and I think I see a lot of really, really good people in the church that are friends uh, that I've grown up with, that are people in the evergreen who are very good people, but they won't accept that this is okay. And so the fact that they're denying it is creating such a dilemma that they end up, it's almost like a perversion. They go to the parks and they have anonymous sex encounters with strangers. And it's, I think it's very sick compared to what I was experiencing in a loving, a close relationship that I was developing with this one friend and with, and then these other friendships of all these other guys that I could give a hug and a kiss and just really feel good about our friendship and, and fulfill those needs. Um, it's a wonderful thing. I just, I really love being with the gay men that I've met. I, I think people in the church, they really think and I, and I used to think this too, and I mean, I, I've kind of changed myself a lot of the ways I think, but gay was this horrible bad thing, and it was sex and drugs and alcohol, and it was very dysfunctional, and it was people hiding and not being honest about their relationships. And uh, I guess there is this part of the homosexual world, but it's just one part of it. There's also this whole other part of it, just like the heterosexual world has some bad people that are acting out and sexual and not, not true to their spouses and whatever. So the way I deal with this now is by being involved socially with other men. I sing with the men's choir. I, ha I participate in a running group. I am involved in my local ward and ward choir and uh, through my studies at BYU. All of these activities provide uh, for my, for my needs in a way that I can keep the church standards. I think for me, uh, it's very healthy to just say that I have attractions to men, and it's not a bad thing, and I love men, and I think the love I have for them is good. It doesn't have to be sexual. I don't have to fulfill sexual fantasies, but just to say that I'm okay person, and the love that I feel for other men is not a bad thing, is a good thing, and I can make it a good thing, and uh, I can have all the same blessings of any other person in the church. At least President Hinckley says that gay people should be allowed to go forward as any other uh, member of the church that's worthy, and I think that this is an area that the church needs to work on. I don't think that we're really fulfilling what President Hinckley said, because I have friends in Evergreen who are, have not been allowed to have any callings in their wards and have not been allowed to have any positions of trust. I don't think that I'm treated the same way in all. I think, uh, I don't think that, uh, that we've accomplished what President Hinckley has, has called for, that we treat people the same as we treat everyone else. Uh, I'm okay in the church as long as I say I'm same-sex attracted instead of saying I'm gay, as long as I hide in the, sh in the corner of the room and never say, make a comment about my own sexuality, as long as I uh, am not affirming, as long as in my classes at BYU we talk about homosexuality a lot, it comes up a lot, but it's always in a very negative way. And uh, if I was to say something positive, uh, I feel like I'm not at liberty to do that. I'm taking a chance of uh, being kicked out of the school by saying what I think. And uh, I do push the envelope, and I'm not in the cl closet. There are some people there that know about my situation, uh, but I don't publicize it. I don't feel any reason to be 
political. I just want a chance to be uh, to be a member of the church in good standing, and I don't feel like I should have to be in the closet to do that. I don't think that I should have to have a dysfunctional attitude about myself and my own uh, intimacy and my own friends in order to be a member of the church. For a wise and glorious purpose Thou hast placed me here on earth My study of this issue and Gary's story helps us understand that when young people of the church have homosexual attractions, they cannot expect these inclinations to go away. They may, as Gary, look at the odds for success in marriage and decide to remain single. But they should, as our prophet says, be helped to go forward as any other member of the church.